Alright, what's going on everyone? Today we're going to take a look at another World Championship winning deck in Magic the Gathering's history and this time it is Bant Humans, the deck that won the championship in 2016. So standard at the time was a little bit complicated because we were transitioning between the traditional 3 block structure and the very short lived 2 block structure at the time. So standard was composed of the Dragons of Tarkir set, the Battle for Zendikar block, the Innistrad block, and Magic Origins. The tournament would take place in Seattle, Washington and the deck would be piloted by Brian Bronduin. So there were two key pieces that made this deck really good. First is Thalia's Lieutenant, a 2 mana 1-1 one, one that puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on all humans you control when it enters the battlefield. But then it gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter on itself whenever you play another human. It's an interesting pseudo lord thing. It doesn't exactly buff all of your humans all the time but it gives them a permanent at plus one plus one counter even if it dies and then it itself gets massive and becomes a big beater if it is left unattended. So pretty good. The other major big hitter in the deck was actually Collected Company. If you play modern you probably know what this does but if you don't it's a four mana instant that lets you look at the top six cards of your library, pick two creatures that have a converted mana cost of three or less that's individually not total and put them directly onto the battlefield. That's pretty powerful and even more so that it happens at instant speed since you can play it during combat and get surprise blockers and in a tribal deck with things like Thalia's Lieutenant those creatures not only come into play as a surprise but they also distribute plus one plus one counters or just you know add lots of synergy on your board that your opponent wasn't expecting when they declared attackers. It could lead to devastating losses on the opponent's side leaving them vulnerable to future attacks which is what a tribal deck is you know all about so pretty good collected company pretty good and a deck that's looking to both play a whole bunch of small creatures and also just you know in a tribal deck any tribal deck is gonna benefit from collected company for sure which is why it's usually played in spirits and humans and slivers and elves you know if it's a green deck and it has tribal synergies probably plays collected company so let's move to the rest of the humans in the deck it played both thraben inspector and Knight of the White Orchid. Both of these are solid early game threats that generate a little bit of value. The Inspector is a 1-2 for 1 mana which actually made it pretty sturdy in the early game and was played quite a bit in standard plus it comes with a clue token which could get you a card later in the game. Plus if you top deck it in the late game at least you have a clue token to hopefully draw into a better threat. So it was basically useful no matter what point of the game you drew it in. The Knight is a 2 mana 2-2 two, two with first strike so one once again a pretty solid early game creature but it also lets you search for a planes when it enters the battlefield if the opponent has more lands than you so it can ramp you when you're on the draw. Not bad. And after that it played Reflector Mage and Thalia Heretic Cathar. And these two are really good at being disruptive. The Reflector Mage is a 3 mana 2-3 that bounces one of the opponent's creatures when it enters the battlefield plus they're not allowed to recast it the following turn or any other copies they might have in hand with the same name. Thalia is a 3 mana 3 2 with first strike that causes creatures and non basic lands to enter tapped on the opponent's side of the board. What makes these creatures so good is they create a bit of a tempo advantage. As a tribal deck the biggest issue can be opposing creatures. You really want to just get in and attack the opponent but once the opponent starts playing blockers it can be really difficult to punch through that last bit of damage. The reflector mage basically removing a creature for two turns is fantastic and Thalia basically ensures the opponent is playing one turn behind when it comes to blockers because every blocker they play comes into play tapped so basically from a combat step perspective you're kind of one turn ahead of your opponent when you're putting pressure on and then after that the deck played tireless tracker which is just an all-around solid creature that was an absolute powerhouse and standard and also pretty good in modern and conveniently just so happened to be a human it's a three mana three two that says whenever you play a land you get a clue token which of course can be sacrificed to draw a card. So it's already pretty good but then in the late game if you start getting flooded all those excessive lands start generating an opportunity to draw a card. So those late game lands are no longer dead draws. Then Tireless Tracker also gets a plus one plus one counter whenever you sacrifice a clue token so it can become a large game ending threat if left unanswered. Tireless Tracker was just a value machine and a pretty fantastic beater as well so it was definitely auto include in a tribal humans deck. The 
Sonic also played the Lamp Hold Pacifist, which is a 2 mana 3 3, but it can't attack unless you already control a creature with 4 power. However, it can flip into Lamp Bolt Butcher, which is a 4 4 beater that you ultimately just paid 2 mana for. So it is a very aggressive creature. However, the Werewolf isn't the best part. You see, the Pacifist can attack unless you control a creature with power 4 or greater, but it just so happens that Thalia's Lieutenant would put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it since the Pacifist is a human, and that would mean that the Pacifist would actually enable itself to attack. And also note that if the card flips, it doesn't actually lose the counter because it never leaves play. So the Werewolf will ultimately be a 2 mana 5-5, five five, and if it flips back then you still have the 4-4 four four that you paid 2 mana for. So yeah, this is very aggressive, allows the deck to put a lot of power out super quick, and the biggest drawback is negated by the best Lord in the deck, that being Thalia's Lieutenant. It also led to a very aggressive start. You know, if you could do like turn 1 Inspector into turn 2 Pacifist, followed by a turn 3 Lieutenant, that would allow you to attack with a 2-3 and a 4-4 four four right then, which is a pretty fast, pretty fast for standard. That's a lot of power really quick, and that was certainly possible. The deck also played a single copy of Dust Watch Recruiter. It's a 2 mana 2-2 two two that allows you to pay 3 mana to look at the top 3 cards of your library, reveal a creature, and put it into your hand, which was really good in the late game so you could dig for more threats when you might be starting to gas out. It also flips into Kalan Horde Howler, which is a respectable 3-3 three three that actually makes casting the creatures that you grab with the recruiter side of the card cheaper to cast, which is convenient. So ideally you dig for creatures and then play them for a reduced cost. Not bad. The deck also played Dromoka's Command, which was the only instant or sorcery in the deck besides Collected Company. It can prevent damage from a spell, force the opponent to sacrifice an enchantment, put a plus one plus one counter on a creature, or force two creatures to fight, and you get to pick two of those modes when you cast it, and the counter is notable because once again it will enable Lamhole Pacifist if you haven't found a lieutenant. So there you go. And the final card in the deck is actually Cameo Field Researcher. If you tick her up, you get to target two creatures, and then if those creatures deal damage of any kind until your next turn, you get to draw a card. This is actually very versatile because you can target your own creatures when you're on the offense to draw more threats to close out the game, but if you were on defense, if you were, you know, lagging behind, you could target your opponent's creatures to discourage them from attacking, since they'll let you draw cards if those creatures deal damage, which might not be worth it if your opponent is attacking with like a couple of world ones or two twos, you can basically lock them down if you're, you know, on an empty board. Then her minus ability will tap down a couple of creatures and they won't untap during the next untap step so that's another way to deal with blockers so you can get in that final bit of damage and it's also very obnoxious when combined with reflector mage not only is tamio locking down creatures for multiple turns but also reflector mage is bouncing creatures and they can't be replayed for a couple turns so very annoying and then her ultimate lets you draw three cards and then it gives you an emblem saying you can literally cast anything in your hand for free which is kind of crazy and once again it synergizes really well with dusk watch recruiter just because you could you know tutor up a creature and then play it for free then tutor up a creature and play it for free basically you get to pay two mana and get anything in the top of your deck and play it for free if you manage to ultimate tamio so very relevant and that's it taking a quick look at the mana base it played canopy vista and prairie stream which are pretty terrible dual lands actually but you know you got to do what you got to do it also played fortified village and yavamaya coast which also are you know okay but not great the coast is decent the fortified villages not so much it also played evolving wilds which can be cracked for any basic but that basic has to come into play tapped and speaking of basics it played a pile of them i think one of the more interesting aspects of this deck is the fact that the mana bases were kind of terrible in this standard environment because there weren't very many good dual lands and yet a three color deck won the world championship with a really bad mana base because that's all there was hmm, interesting anyway taking a super quick look at the sideboard as always we won't go too in depth here as that requires an understanding of the entire metagame, but the deck played extra copies of Knight of the White Orchid and Duskwatch Recruiter. It also had Declaration and Stone and Tragic Arrogance. It also had Negate and Days Undoing. Negate is a counterspell and Days Undoing forces each player to shuffle their hands into their library and then draw seven cards. It also had Nyss of Vastwood Seer, which flips into a Planeswalker and you can pause this and read it if you want, but basically it's good at getting lands and animating them into creatures. And then finally it played Gideon an ally of Zendikar, which animates into an indestructible 5-5 creature, and it also pumps out a bunch of tokens and gives you an anthem effect of sorts. And that's it. That is the deck. It didn't actually play a ton of tribal human cards. In fact, it only played one, that being
being Thalia's lieutenant. But so many of the humans were just standalone good that the lieutenant was able to just bring it all together. I mean, Reflector Mage was banned because it was so good. Tireless Tracker is fantastic. Collected Company is amazing. Thalia is really good. You know, you have so many modern playable cards here. And then you just had the lieutenant that just worked really well because everything just so happened to be humans. So yeah, there you go. Banned humans. The deck that won the world championship in 2016. Now you are a little bit more familiar with Magic the Gathering's history and another classic deck from years past. If you like this video and want to see more like it, I have an entire playlist dedicated to these world championship decks and you can find a link to it in the description below. Also consider subscribing as there will surely be more to come in the future. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.